Okay, welcome back. This is the second lecture of the series. Um, before we get going, I should just comment. If you have questions on anything I say in the lecture, feel free to send an email. Um, if it's a question that I think a lot of people might have, I'll post the answer on the webpage so that everyone else can benefit from, from the answer. Okay, um, we left off in 1938 uh, with the discovery of the superfluidity effect, the fact that you can push uh, helium in its low temperature phase, the helium two phase, two in Roman numerals, the what we now call the superfluid phase, it can go through a channel which is arbitrarily thin with apparently no viscosity whatsoever. This was discovered by Kapitza and and Allen, um, and there's a little bit of a conundrum, which is that despite the fact that you can push the uh, superfluid through an arbitrarily small channel, if you try to measure the viscosity using a vibrating wire or a vibrating string, like a violin string, um, you got a different answer. You would discover that there is viscosity um, at any finite temperature and the viscosity dropping to zero as you go down towards zero temperature. Now, Kapitza felt that the person who would really be able to help him figure out what was going on was uh, the great scientist Lev Landau. And Lev Landau will come back many times throughout this course. You know, about half of the things we study in this course are things that were discovered or developed by, by Landau. But unfortunately, 1938 was not a really good time for Lev Landau because uh, he had made a very bad mistake, and his bad mistake was publicly comparing Stalin to Hitler. And if you were in the Soviet Union during the Stalin era, if you publicly say that Stalin is like Hitler, um, that actually was probably enough to, to you know, get you executed for most people, but since Landau was famous, they just threw him in jail and probably had intended to throw away the key. Um, after about a year, Kapitza did manage to get Landau out again, um, uh, basically um, by promising uh, Stalin a few things. One, promising that if, if he didn't get Landau out, he would quit as a scientist, that Kapitza would quit. Two, saying that if he did get Landau out, they would, they would figure out superfluidity and they would win a Nobel Prize. And three, he um, said that if Lando ever opened his mouth again and said anything political, then um, Kapitza would take the full blame himself, basically putting his head on the line uh, for Lando. So Lando did get out uh, a year later. Actually, it, it said that during Lando's time in jail, although he was basically tortured, he spent his time in solitary confinement constructing the structure of uh, the Lando Lifshitz series uh, of books, which was then written by, by Lifshitz. They say that every word was written by Lifshitz, but every idea came from, from Landau. Um, anyway, so they, they lost um, more or less a year worth of, of, of time. And during that year, other scientists were, um, uh, were hot on the case. In particular, there were uh, two scientists working in Paris, um, Laszlo Tiza, uh, Laszlo Tiza, um, working with Fritz London. Fritz London. London will come back and um, be a, um, an important person in a number of different uh, aspects of things that we discuss uh, later on. Fritz London and his brother Heinz were world experts in, in cryogenics, both Jewish refugees from Germany. And at this, at this point in time, 1938, Fritz London was, was in Paris. He would eventually end up in, in the United States. And he had a, a young, a young postdoc by the name of Laszlo Tiza. I believe he was Hungarian. Um, Tiza also ended up in the United States at, at MIT. I think he lived to be about 101 years old and uh, just died only, only 10 years ago now, more or less, he lived to a very ripe old age. Anyway, Tiza um, had this idea that superfluidity, this superfluid effect, was somehow related to Bose-Einstein condensation. Bose-Einstein condensation was was uh, thought of first by, by Einstein in 1925. Everyone knows the story about how Bose had this idea about statistics of photons um, and calculating their, their statistical mechanical property, and he couldn't get the public paper published, so he he wrote to Einstein, and Einstein realized that this was was important, and he realized that it wasn't it wasn't anything that was special. To, um, to photons, but you could have other particles which also uh, obeyed this new type of statistic, and he predicted that you could have um, Bose-Einstein condensation for non-interacting uh, bo uh, bosonic particles. 
Anyway, so so Tisa thought that um, the superfluidity effect in in helium must have something to do with Bose-Einstein condensation. And he started um, making a story about you know some models of uh, of the physics of superfluid helium based on Bose-Einstein condensation. And some of the ideas that later got developed by Landau actually were were initiated um, by Tisa. So he was on the right track, at least somewhat, realizing that, that helium was a, um, was a boson. Um, however, there were some problems with that, and Landau immediately understood what the problems with this, this picture were. Uh, first of all, uh, helium is not a non-interacting boson. As we've mentioned before, it has very, very strong short-range interactions. If you try to take two uh, helium atoms and stick them right on top of each other, they repel each other extremely strongly. So you can't use the calculation that Einstein did uh, in, in any way. Um, the second thing, which um, uh, is, is a bit of a problem, is you can, you can go through the calculation in some, uh, some detail and discover that non-interacting bosons, as they go through the condensation transition, there is no divergence in the heat capacity. Whereas uh, it was measured in, in the experiment that as you go through the, this uh, superfluid transition, in helium, the heat capacity di diverges. Um, so that's an obvious difference. The big difference, which wasn't apparent to many people, but was understood immediately by Landau, was that a non-interacting BEC, a Bose-Einstein condensation made of non-interacting bosons, will not superflow. They actually, and we'll, we'll do this derivation in, in um, uh, later on, um, but he, he realized that the interactions had to be extremely important for, for making the the superfluid effect, the fact that the, the viscosity appears to drop to, to zero. And Landau felt that thinking about this in terms of Bose-Einstein condensation was really not the right, uh, the right physics. It was not the right direction. He may have felt that even more strongly than was justified because there's, um, you know, there's some respects in which the fact that helium being a boson is important. Um, and that was clarified a little bit later, um, you know, to some extent by Feynman. Um, and Landau was a person of very strong opinions, and he felt that you, that you shouldn't even say the word boson when you're talking about helium. He said the physics is just completely different, and we should really be looking in, in a different uh, direction. There was another thing that, that made Landau sort of work in a, uh, you know, go away from this picture of Bose-Einstein condensation, which is that um, for some reason, which I've not been able to find in, written in the literature or in history books, Lando apparently really hated Fritz London, um, and he had something against this guy. Um, he never cited him. I think once in his life he wrote a paper that should have cited him, but because he didn't really want to cite Fritz London, he intentionally mistakenly cited his brother Heinz London to you know just to annoy him. So I'm not sure exactly what was going on there, but he really disliked London and anything that London had proposed. Landau sort of wanted to knock down. Um, so Landau was a, was a little bit of an odd personality, despite being a genius. Anyway, so Landau develops um, what we call now call the two fluid model of, su of superfluids, two fluid model, uh, and um, and also so he does two things. He develops a two fluid model of superfluids, and fluid. Oops. Um, well, okay, I'll just write it down here. Two, two fluid model of superfluids, and also. Uh, a criterion, a criterion for superflow. When will uh, something superflow and when will it not? Um, so this, these advances are what earned uh, Landau a Nobel Prize uh, somewhat later in, in, in 1962, although it was, um, you know, there were many things that Landau could have been awarded a Nobel Prize for. He was incredibly prolific. Um, this was the one that, that was chosen, that he would win his prize for um, understanding of, of low-temperature helium. Um, you know, the uh, rather sad part of his story is that um, he's never enjoyed his Nobel Prize. Um, he, uh, just a few months before the announcement of the Nobel Prize, he was in a car crash and he was in a coma. Um, and although he did come out of the coma, he never really fully recovered from, from his injuries. He never did any productive physics after, uh, after the car crash in, in 1962, and he died uh, in 1968, really from, from injuries from that, from that car crash. 
uh, fairly young at, at, at age 60, uh, a rather terrible end for someone who is, who is in, so incredibly influential for uh, 20th, century, 20th century science. Okay, so we're going to start with the two-fluid model of superfluidity. Um, so maybe that's just, um, okay, two-fluid model, write it again, two-fluid model. Um, and it was based on uh, ideas by Tisa, and in fact, the ideas by Tisa go back to sort of a two-fluid picture that London had developed um, for superconductors. Now, historically, a lot of research was done on superconductors before superfluids that, that you know, people understood this a little bit more. I mean, they, they, at least phenomenologically, they, they saw superconductivity um, experimentally in, in um, you know, the, in 1911. And it was only in 1938 that they discovered superfluid flow, uh, even though these two things look, look fairly similar. So a lot of, you know, models and, and thinking had gone into superconductivity before anyone had been, had been able to think about superfluidity. We're going to study the superfluidity first and then try to, you know, work backwards and, and apply some of the things we learned from the superfluids neutral superfluids to the charge superfluid, which is a superconductor. So we're doing things out of historical order um, because it's, uh, it's easier to think about that way. So what is this two-fluid model? Well, the, the two-fluid model is that we should propose that there are two models, that, sorry, two fluids, one which we call super and the other which we call normal. And this is, um, uh, you know, and these two fluids are interpenetrating, that they fill space um, in the same place and they just sort of pass right through each other. So the density, so the mass density of, of superfluid, the, the, the mass density of superfluid plus the mass density of the normal fluid is going to be the total mass density. So this is the super fraction, uh, super, and this will be the normal fraction, normal. And the idea is that the super fraction has no viscosity, it carries no heat, it's this you know, special superfluid part, and the normal fraction is just normal fluid. And the, the, um, uh, the motivation for this is that um, if you have two interpenetrating fluids and you try to push them through a channel, the normal fluid, which is viscous, will just sit still, but the superfluid still flows through, so you measure that there's fluid flowing through the channel. However, if you have a vibrating wire, that wire, as it moves, it still has to push the normal fluid out of the way, and so the um, so the it will measure viscosity because it has to push both the superfluid fluid out of the way and the normal fluid has to get pushed out of the way as the wire vibrates. So it will measure a um, uh, a finite viscosity. So that's the general idea of having two interpenetrating fluids. Um, so actually, so I should I should stop here and, and back up. This is you know the, the nomenclature of the two fluid model is is again a horrible nomenclature. If we back up to um, this phase diagram we had from from last lecture, you'll notice that we have super fluid down down here. We call this you know, helium capital two or Roman numeral two. We call that super, and then this is normal fluid over here. And that's helium one. So this is this is a really horrible nomenclature because what we're doing now is is different. We're saying that um, whenever we're in the super phase down here, what we have is actually a mixture of normal fluid and super fluid. And up here it's all it's all normal fluid. So this is now mixed some fraction of super fluid and some fraction of normal fluid, and you measure as if it's super fluid. Um, over here, it's all normal fluid. So the picture we have is um, that at uh, temperature equals zero, um, the normal fluid will have zero density and the superfluid will be um, the total density. Everything will be super. At the temperature above the critical temperature, the normal fluid will be all of the fluid and the superfluid fraction will be zero. And then in between, in between here, it interpolates. Oops, um, so I'll just do this. Uh, da, 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 interpolates. 
rates in between. So as you go between uh, zero temperature and the critical temperature, you start with um, all superfluid fraction, and as you raise the temperature more and more, it becomes partially normal fluid fraction and partially superfluid fraction until you hit the, the critical temperature where it is all normal fluid fraction. Okay, that's the general idea. Now, how how is it we're supposed to um, how is it we're supposed to interpret the um, the superfluid fraction? Well, the way we we interpret the superfluid fraction is um, at least roughly we can think of the superfluid fraction as being um, kind of like, um, okay, super equals um, the condensate or the ground state. Uh, let's write it as condensate. Uh, and in the case, you know, again, it's, it's, we're not actually thinking about a Bose-Einstein condensate here because we know that, uh, or we will find out that, that in a Bose condensate, um, fluid doesn't flow with no viscosity. But if it were a Bose condensate, we, you know, remember in, in when we did calculations for Bose-Einstein condensation, below the critical temperature, there's a macroscopic fraction of the particles that are in a single eigenstate. And you can think of the superfluid fraction as that fraction of particles that are in this ground state. So it's sort of like being in the ground state, the special state where you can put bosons and the bosons all behave in some very special quantum mechanical way. So for a BEC, this would just be the fraction of particles in that single lowest energy level eigenstate. For a uh, real superfluid with interactions, it's something a little bit more complicated. Okay, so, okay. so um, when we have uh, this superfraction and normal fraction, we can write down an expression for the uh, current of particles, um, which will be the mass density, uh, the super mass density times the super velocity, the velocity of the super part of the fluid, the super fraction, plus the normal density times the velocity of the normal fraction. And these two velocities can be completely different. Okay. Um, we're going, and this is going to be part of the, of the story, that you can have two velocities interpenetrating and they can have different, different velocities. Two fluids interpenetrating with, with different velocities. There's one more thing that we want to add to the, the story, and that is uh, a constraint. And the constraint is that the curl of the superfluid velocity, let me draw that a little bit better, the curl of the superfluid velocity is zero. Um, now, we're going, we can treat this as a conjecture for now, um, and we'll justify it a little bit more later on. But if you think about what is viscosity, and you know, you know why, do, why do we have it, um, or how do you define it, it actually makes quite a bit of sense that this, this condition of, uh, of curl being zero is, is sensible for... Um, uh, a dissipationless uh, fluid or fluid without uh, without viscosity. So let's try to understand what why this is. So um, let's remember how it is that you define viscosity in the first place. So to define viscosity, you set up the following experiment. You um, uh, let's see. So let's make a, a wall here. You set up a wall here. It's like this, and then another wall over here, and we're gonna put fluid in between. So there's fluid in between. This wall over here um, oops, is going to be moving at uh, some velocity over here. Okay, And then because the, the fluid sticks to the wall, we are going to um, set up a shear uh, flow of the, of the fluid like this. So this, the fluid down, um, down over here is sticking to the, the wall is stationary, so it has no velocity, and the fluid over here is moving along with the velocity uh, of this wall. Then, in order to calculate the velocity, or in order, sorry, to, in order to calculate the viscosity, you, or to even define the viscosity, you want to figure out what is the, um, the force between these two walls when you try to shear the fluid. Um, now, what you should realize here is that 
this um, fluid flow has curl of velocity not equal to zero. So if you insist that a fluid has no viscosity, sorry, has no curl at all, you can't even define viscosity because you can't set up this experiment. Okay, now we can do a little bit better than that, um, than saying that you can't define it, therefore it um, uh, has no viscosity. But let's uh, do a sort of a simple case. Let's imagine that you have a uh, fixed density. So we fix uh, the superfluid density and let's just set the superfluid density be the, to be the total density. So imagine we're at zero temperature where all of the fluid is, is superfluid. Okay. Um, now, if you have fixed density of fluid, you know that the divergence of the velocity is going to be zero. That's just current conservation. And then we've imposed the curl of the velocity um, to also be um, to also be zero, okay? Um, that's our our constraint. Now these two conditions uh, imply that the Laplacian of the velocity is zero, and and the reason for that is well, okay, the Laplacian is um, uh, we use one of these vector identities. It's the gradient of the divergence of v minus the curl of the curl of v of v um, and if we set the divergence of v to be zero and the curl of v to be zero then in fact this whole thing is zero now why is it important that the that the laplacian of the velocity field is zero well let's think about the navier stokes equation navier stokes and roughly the navier stokes equation can be written as uh, the the co-moving derivative uh, of the velocity field plus, I guess, one over the density times the gradient of the pressure uh, equals uh, the viscosity over the density times the Laplacian of the velocity field. Uh, this co-moving derivative is the usual d by dt plus, I guess, velocity dot gradient um, all applied to the oops applied to the velocity here. Um, so this should look familiar from your fluid dynamics courses. The point here is if the, um, if the Laplacian of the velocity field is zero, then the viscosity term on the right-hand side of the Navier-Stokes equation equals zero, and you have um, uh, uh, a flow equals, equals zero. So you can see the zero there. There it is, equals zero. Um, and this means that you have a flow that has uh, no viscosity or no dissipation, okay? So this is why this initial uh, guess or conjecture that the superfluid field, the superfluid velocity field should have no curl is a very sensible uh, restriction to put on the superfluid field, uh, fluid flow and make it unlike other fluids by this constraint, okay? So um, Let's uh, move on to some other things that were observed by uh, about uh, superfluids. And uh, another physical effect that was observed very shortly after the um, observation of, of superfluid flow. This was also observed by, uh, by um, John Allen in Cambridge. And then it was um, explained shortly thereafter by Heinz London. Uh, the other London brother, who was, I think, he was in, in the UK at the time. I think he might have been at, at um, Birmingham or Bristol. I, I can't remember. He, they had been, the, the London brothers, they had been, um, you know, they were Jewish refugees from Germany, and they came to, actually came to Oxford. Uh, uh, Lindemann had the first um, Viscount Churwell, who was the head of the physics department in Oxford, had a program for bringing Jewish refugee scientists into uh, Oxford, and he'd keep them here as long as he could possibly uh, give them jobs. And then um, they couldn't stay forever because he didn't have that many jobs, but they would find places uh, elsewhere to go to. Anyway, so both London brothers uh, came through Oxford. Uh, Heinz London went off to, um, I can't remember if it's Birmingham or Bristol or Manchester. Anyway, another university not too far away. And, um, and actually, I think he spent the remainder of his life there. Um, and it was Bristol. Um, anyway, um, Heinz London, for anyone who happens to be an experimentalist or is thinking about being an experimentalist, is, should be a hero to everyone in cryogenics 
because Heinz London uh, invented the dilution refrigerator. The dilution refrigerator is the way to cool things down to low temperatures, you know, below say 300 millikelvin. Um, it's rather, it's a very, very clever invention. It was invented by Heinz London. Anyway, this is all a digression. So the effect that we're gonna talk about is the fountain effect, fountain effect. And it was actually, um, you know, a serendipitous discovery. It was a mistake. And you know when you, you have a very good experimentalist on your hands, when they figure out when a mistake is interesting. So Alan made this mistake in his experiment and he realized it was interesting uh, immediately. So the, the effect is the following. You take a, a bucket of your uh, superfluid like this and you uh, maybe fill it up to some level like this and you put in the bucket of the superfluid a, uh, a tube like this, going down like this, okay? And then you plug the tube with a porous plug, okay? This is a porous plug, porous plug. So in his case, I think it was just cotton really jammed in very, very, very tight. And then you add a, a heater up here. Okay, so there's gonna be fluid up here as well. And we're gonna see that the level will, will rise in here. But okay, we put a little heater in here. So a little, um, little filament with which you run current through. So this is going to be going to a heater. So this region above the porous plug gets hot. And what, so this is now hot T hot, and this is at the temperature T, which is lower. And what, um, what he found is as you heat up the region above the porous plug, the level of the fluid inside that little tube goes up. And it goes up dramatically, actually. And it's called the fountain effect because if you just raise the temperature above the porous plug a little, a little bit, it, it really, it, the level goes up so much, it fountains out the top unless you have a very, very tall, um, a very, very tall uh, column. Um, so basically what, you know, the, when you see this experiment, it's, it's, again, it's a very impressive experiment. You, you heat up the area above the porous plug and the helium just starts shooting out, uh, fountaining out the top, hence the name, the, the fountain effect. And the explanation that was um, given by Heinz London was in terms of this, this two fluid model of, of Tisa or Landau. And his argument is it's like osmosis. Like, oops, uh, let's just change that color back so, so that it doesn't get too uh, crowded. So it's like osmosis. Um, so when you raise the temperature to T plus delta T, to raise, raise the temperature up to a slightly higher temperature, because the temperature has gotten higher, oops, uh, my gosh, sorry, didn't mean to erase that. Um, so we wanna raise it to T plus delta T, um, the concentration, concentration of, of normal fluid goes up. Um, why? Because it, at zero temperature, it's all superfluid fraction. And at, um, as you raise the temperature, the superfluid fraction goes down and the normal fluid fraction goes up until you get to the critical temperature in which it's all uh, normal fluid. Um, now, so what does that mean? What this means is in this hot region, in hot region, hot region, you have higher uh, rho n dissolved in uh, rho s. So you can think of, of, of the, the normal fluid fraction as being a, a, a solute dissolved in the solvent, which is the, the, the normal fluid. And what happens then is, is, is basically just like osmosis, the, the, there will be a, an osmotic force that tries to um, equalize the concentrations. This is ju just like, you know, when you put salt on two different sides of a, you know, you put salt on one side of the membrane, the, the fluid flows through the membrane to try to bring the concentration of salt to equilibrium on the, on the two sides. Um, so it's trying to flow the superfluid through 
the porous plug in order to bring the concentration of normal fluid within the superfluid back down to a, a lower concentration so that the normal fluid is in equilibrium or that the, the temperature is in equilibrium. Now this might look a little bit like a, a violation of the second law because you have flow from something colder to something hotter, but the, what's flowing from colder to hotter actually has um, zero entropy. So you're not moving anything with heat. So the, the superfluid has zero entropy. So you're not moving anything with, with heat from colder to hotter, so it's not violating the second law. Okay, so we can, we can actually calculate um, in a little bit more detail exactly how much uh, pressure change you get for, um, uh, um, uh, for how, much, how much temperature change. So we'll do a thermodynamic calculation, thermodynamics. Um, and we'll use the Gibbs-Duheim relation, Gibbs-Duheim, which hopefully you remember from, from StatMec, but if you don't remember, I'll, I'll give it to you. The change in the chemical potential is minus the entropy per particle times the change in temperature plus the volume plus per particle times the change in, um, in pressure. And if something is in equilibrium, then we expect that the um, uh, chemical potential is, is in equilibrium on, on two sides. So the way we set up this experiment is we have a, a box over here, which we have at temperature and pressure. This is all filled with, with helium, of course. Um, and then a little tube like this. And then another box over here, which will be a T plus delta T and P plus delta P. And in between, we'll have a uh, porous plug, um, plug. This plug um, is what's known as a super leak. Um, so it doesn't allow normal fluid to go back and forth between the two sides and only allows superfluid to move back and forth between the two sides. And the reason it has to be a super leak is because if, if you allowed fluid to go back and forth freely between the two sides, then you can't have a pressure difference between the two sides. The pressure will just immediately come to, to equilibrium. However, the, um, the particles can go back and forth via the super, super fluid, and in order to be in equilibrium, they have to uh, come to a point where, they, where the chemical potentials on the two sides are equal. So um, in order to get the chemical potentials on the two sides equal, we just set the, uh, so the change in chemical potential to zero, and that allows us to derive that the change in pressure over the change in temperature is just the entropy divided by uh, the volume. And you know you might think that, that entropy is hard to, to measure, but actually it's not that hard to measure because you know that um, the entropy of T can be written as the heat capacity of T divided by T, uh, dT from zero to T. I guess these are T primes. So like this now, okay, you can't actually measure the heat capacity down to zero temperature, but you can extrapolate. To, to do this integral. So this gives you a, a way to calculate exactly how much the pressure changes when the, when the temperature changes. Okay, um, so another effect um, that one, one predicts or one can actually measure in, um, in superfluid helium is a thermomechanical effect. I mean, I guess the, uh, the fountain effect is a thermomechanical effect in, in some respects. You're putting in thermodynamics and you're getting uh, motion uh, you're putting in your temperature and you're getting motion out as, as a result. So you can have more, more dramatic thermomechanical effects and, and here's one of them. So let's imagine we have a big box um, like this, a closed box like that, maybe a closed tube like this. And on this side, it will be at temperature T and this side, we're going to heat it up a little bit to T plus delta T. Okay. Now you might think that, that fluid will flow from one side to the other, but but the box is, has you know, fixed walls. There's no way for the fluid to flow. So there can be no net flow of fluid. So there's going to be J total uh, equals zero. There's going to be no, no net flow of fluid from one side to the other. Um, however, if we put a little propeller um, in between, like this, a little fan, um, the fan will spin. It will observe, um, and we can, the, the fan can be even bigger, 
take the entire width. Let's see if we can do this. Takes the entire width to try to measure how much fluid is flowing. And the fan will spin. And the fan will spin um, as if fluid is flowing um, from the hot to the cold. Now, why is this? Well, the reason for this is there's no net flow of fluid, but you have normal fluid flowing from hot to cold. Uh, da, da, da. Normal fluid going from hot to cold, J normal, because where, where you're hot, you have a higher um, density of normal fluid. And then you have superfluid, J super, going from cold to hot. And the reason that these two have to oppose each other and they have to be exactly opposite currents, um, JS exactly opposite uh, J normal here. Uh, they have to be exactly opposite and equal because otherwise you have net amount of fluid flow. And since it's a closed box, um, J normal. Gosh, so terrible at drawing, aren't I? I want to make this arrow just as big as the arrow going the other way. Okay, now it looks like these two arrows are opposite and equal. Um, that was the intent. Um, Right, that they have to be opposite and equal because there should be no net fluid flow because there's nowhere for the fluid to go. It's a closed box. You can't have any net fluid flow. Okay, or um, where's the fluid gonna, going, to, going to go to? The fan spins in response to the normal fluid only. Fan spins in response to normal fluid only. Why is that? Well, um, uh, oops, maybe I'll make myself smaller so you can see what's going on there. There. Um, so um, the fan spins in response to the normal fluid only for the following reason. If, um, if the superfluid could dissipate mechanical energy, then there would be resistance to it flowing through any channel. It would always be able to dissipate energy to you know something on the side of the system, to some particle on the edge. You can try to move the, the edge of the channel, you can try to push the edge of the channel, um, and that doesn't happen. We know that the superfluid flows with no resistance whatsoever, which means it must flow completely freely by any obstacle. So it cannot dissipate any mechanical energy on its way. The normal fluid is just a regular fluid. It can dissipate mechanical energy, it can turn the fan. But the superfluid, because it's super and because it cannot dissipate mechanical energy, it cannot give up its energy to anything, it must uh, not turn the fan. So the, so the fan turns in response to the normal fluid flowing and not in response to the superfluid flowing. Okay? So this is kind of a, uh, an interesting experiment uh, which demonstrates a thermomechanical effect. Now this counterflow of you know equal, equal and opposite counterflow of the normal and the superfluid suggests the concept of what became known as second sound. Suggests second sound. So second sound was, was first proposed by, by Laszlo Tiza, um, but it was worked out, it was finally worked out correctly by, uh, by Landau. I mean, Tiza had some, some guesses as, as to how it worked, but, but it was, of course, Landau who, who actually got it right in the end. Um, so let's try to remember how it is that regular sound works to begin with. So regular sound, um, you know, it's a time-dependent effect. But so let's start with at, at time equals zero. At time equals zero, um, you might have a current in one place. So J will be going this way here. But then at some, some distance later, the current will be going the other way. And then some distance later, the current will be going the other way. And then some distance later, the current will be going the other way. And the, and the current is, um, you know, periodic in in space. And then if you go to time t over two, the current is flowing the opposite direction in each point in space. So this is basically just fluid flowing back and forth as a, as a function of time. the The wavelength is is this. This is lambda, the wavelength, and there's some some velocity which relates that the time period to the, the wavelength. So what this is, is you know, the, the fluid will compress in some region, and then you know, half a time period later, it will you know, rarefy in that region. And, you know, the fluid is sloshing back and forth and making 
a regular sound wave. So this is basically mass motion. Motion, build up mass in one region, then comes back, goes forward and backwards like this. And that's how regular sound works. Right? This is just a density wave. Okay, so what's the idea of second sound? Okay, we can, we can compare that to the idea of, um, uh, of second sound, second sound, which is instead of being a density wave, it is a, uh, a counterflow wave. Uh, second sound equals counterflow wave. Or we can think of it as entropy waves. And the important thing to realize is that there's no mass motion. And the way uh, we get this is by having counterflow of normal and, and superfluid. So at some given time, t equals zero, at some point in space, you'll have uh, superfluid going one direction, but you'll have normal fluid going the in the opposite direction. At some other point in space, you'll have superfluid going to the left and the normal fluid going to the right. And, and so forth. And you'll get these waves of, of, of counterflowing super and normal fluid. Okay? And then at, uh, you know, half a time period later, all of these directions switch. The super is going this way, uh, like this, and then super this way, normal this way, and super this way, JS, and J normal. JS, J normal. So at no point in space is there any uh, mass motion because any mass motion carried by the superfluid is exactly equal by the mass motion carried by the superfluid. However, there are uh, there is motion of entropy because the the normal fluid carries uh, non-zero entropy, whereas the superfluid has zero entropy. So what you're getting instead of mass building up and and sloshing back and forth, what you have is um, entropy building up and, and sloshing back and forth. So you have uh, J total, the, the mass current is zero, but J entropy um, is not equal to zero, okay? So heat current is not equal to zero. And this is what gives um, superfluid helium, is it, the second sound is what gives it extremely good uh, thermal conductance. In fact, it's the highest thermal conductance of, of any known material because it's not conductance the way other materials are. Other materials, th uh, heat conducts diffusively, uh, whereas here it travels ballistically like a, like a sound wave instead. And so you can get uh, the amount of heat that you can, you can transport can be you know, 100 times that uh, what you can transport uh, through copper. So it's an extremely good uh, thermal conductor because it's conducting in a completely different way via these entropy waves rather than just diffusion. So last thing we're going to do, I think in, in this lecture, or second last thing we're going to do, is we're going to actually derive the equations for second sound. It's simplified equations for second sound. I'm going to do some uh, simplifications. So we'll assume the pressure is constant everywhere. Um, and the reason we want it, pressure to be constant everywhere is because if we're building up pressure and, uh, and relaxing pressure, that's regular sound. And we're not interested in, in regular sound. Similarly, we want the total density to be constant everywhere. And again, um, the reason why we want the total density to be co constant is because we want to eliminate the possibility of a regular sound. And we're going to set the total uh, mass current to be zero. Um, so that everywhere, the, um, so that the density stays zero everywhere. The to sorry, the change in density stays zero everywhere. The, the, you don't get mass building up anywhere. And the total uh, mass current will just be the, the normal um, density times the normal velocity times the super density uh, times the super velocity. Okay? And that's going to be set equal to zero. So there's just a couple of steps to, um, uh, to derive second sound. And we sort of have all the pieces. Step one is that a gradient of temperature uh, creates an osmotic force. Creates osmotic force force um, and accelerates uh, the normal fluid opposite the superfluid. Okay, So the normal fluid goes one way due to the uh, osmotic force and then the normal fluid and the superfluid has to go back to, 
to equal it, so there's no net mass current. So the normal fluid velocity dot, just um, you know, if you put a force on something, it will accelerate, is going to equal minus some constant alpha times the gradient of t, where alpha is gradient to, is greater than zero. So this tells you that the normal fluid uh, always flows from hot to cold, and the, and the superfluid is going to uh, conversely go from cold to cold to hot. Um, actually, on, in one of the homework assignments, you're asked to estimate how big is this uh, constant alpha. So the second step, okay, the, the second step is to use entropy uh, or heat conservation, heat conservation. Um, so we'll write S, this is supposed to be a small S, S divided by, I guess, volume or something, uh, will be entropy density, capital S divided by um, Write that capital S divided by volume. Um, that's entropy density. So this small s, we'll write a conservation equation for it. Um, that s small s dot is minus the divergence of the entropy current, and that will be just the entropy density times the normal fluid velocity, because the normal fluid is the only thing that is carrying um, carrying entropy. The superfluid doesn't carry a density, so the velocity of the entropy is just the normal fluid velocity. Then we'll use the fact that the entropy at uh, t plus delta t is entropy at t plus delta t times some constant k, where this constant k is just the heat capacity divided by the temperature, and this is just coming from the fact that um, the heat capacity, this is heat capacity per volume, um, this is coming from the fact that the heat capacity per volume is, well, the heat capacity is just uh, TDS dt at constant volume, and so that gives us the, uh, the coefficient that tells you how much the entropy changes as you change it, as you change uh, the temperature. So this K or, or kappa over here. So um, we can then, um, uh, use this, uh, plug this uh, equation for, for S into here and get an equation for um, kappa um, T dot is S gradient uh, or divergence of, of normal fluid velocity like this. Now you, you might expect that I should have also had a gradient of S term times velocity, but um, there's, there's no such term there because um, uh, the velocity is a small number. You assume that, this, that, that these are all weak perturbations, so the velocity is only moving a little bit. And the entropy change is only moving a little bit. So if I, if I tried to write a term which was gradient of S times, uh, sorry, times, uh, times V normal, um, it's a term that looked like that, this would be a second order in small, so we can throw it out. So let's just throw that out. Not there. Um, okay. So then we differentiate this equation again, and I'll move the, the kappa to the other side. We get T double dot is minus entropy density divided by this kappa parameter um, times uh, divergence of uh, the normal fluid velocity dot. Um, this is gonna differentiate with respect to time, and that will be uh, entropy density divided by kappa times alpha, because we know the normal velocity dot is related to alpha delta t, so it's del squared t. So I've plugged in this equation here um, into uh, here, okay? And this then gives me the t double dot is some constant gamma uh, del squared t with gamma greater than zero, and, and gamma is just these coefficients here, uh, s, k, or, uh, times alpha, that's gamma, okay? Um, so this gives us our, our um, wave equation for temperature, wave equation uh, for temperature or motion of heat. Okay, so this is pretty good. We've now derived um, we've now derived um, second sound as well, and we have a number of, of questions. Okay, so um, before we finish for the day, um, want to uh, just list off a couple questions that we left unanswered. Three questions. And we'll start the next lecture with um, with these three questions.
um, which we still have to come up with a good reason for. One, justify, I mean, we had some justification, the curl of the superfluid velocity equals zero. I mean, we did a little bit of justification of it. It wasn't great justification. We'll try to justify it better. Question two is, why is there superflow? Um, um, and this is not implied by, uh, um, as I will explain why, but this is not implied by zero curl of the superfluid velocity, although you might think it is. We'll explain why it isn't actually implied, why two is not implied by one. So these are two independent items. And the third item is what should we expect the normal fluid to be as a function of temperature and uh, the superfluid to be as a function of temperature? Well, okay, they have to add up to uh, to the total fluid, so if you know one, you know the other. But right now we don't know either of them, and uh, the claim was that at zero temperature it's all superfluid, and then at um, above the critical temperature it's all normal fluid. And so these are the things we're going to address. Uh, we're going to start addressing in in the next lecture, and we'll we'll go from there. Okay, that's it for today.